Welcome everyone to our Thursday webinar. I'm Liz Perry, Crook Canyon's president, and we are absolutely thrilled to be presenting today's uh, uh, webinar. I'm going to run through a couple of our intro slides before I introduce our speaker. As we always start uh, our introductions with the acknowledgement that uh, Crook Canyon acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache, people on whose traditional homelands our institution sits and upon which we all work and reside. Beyond uh, the land acknowledgement, the work that we do at Crook Canyon would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions, not just to us but to all of humankind. We are very grateful to all Indigenous people and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Uh, as it ties directly into our mission, as we mentioned, we would not be here without our Indigenous partners, uh, past and present, and our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education and American Indian knowledge. Please do jump on and check us out on our website at crowcanyon.org to see what future webinars we have coming up and other programs and uh, other happenings at Crow Canyon. Uh, someone sent me a great comic today about how to prepare for a Zoom meeting that involved duct taping your cat to the wall, which we certainly do not advocate. Uh, I was on some meetings with some cats this morning, but you can can move our talking heads over to the right if you grab the black bar adjacent to our faces uh, if, if we're taking up too much space. Uh, also, if you wouldn't mind, as you have questions uh, for our speaker, please use the Q&A function uh, rather than the chat so it doesn't get buried in folks chatting uh, in the chat. But we will we'll keep an eye on both and, and try to get to all of your questions. If you don't get your question answered, we will work on getting it answered after the webinar for you. If your Zoom is giving you trouble, you can jump onto our live stream at uh, Facebook. And if you miss the webinar or any of the other past ones, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and be able to see all of them there. Next week, we have Dr. Patty Crown coming up to talk about her recent work in, at Pueblo Benito. And then after that, we have our very own uh, Fumi Arakawa, who a former Crow Canyon employee, amazing, wonderful person, much beloved here, talking about uh, work that he did in the Membres Mugion region. So without further ado, we are incredibly excited uh, and grateful to bring you this, uh, this talk from Dr. Jennifer Denadale. She is a professor and chair of American studies at the University of New Mexico. She's the author of Reclaiming Diné History, the Legacies of Chief Manuelito and Juanita. And she's written two Navajo histories uh, for young adults. We, uh, part of the reason we are, are very honored to host Dr. Dana Dale, she is the first Diné to earn a PhD in history and has also published numerous articles and essays. We are, we are humbled and honored to have you, Dr. Dana Dale, uh, to deliver your talk. So you. without further ado, I'm gonna stop my share so that you can start yours. Perfect. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very appreciative and I'm appreciative for all of the, oops, let's see. Uh, did I share? You did, but I think your PowerPoint is not up. So you might have to. Give me a it. minute. I'm, where did it go? Okay, now I don't know where it went. Um, so much, just take a second. It disappeared somewhere. Okay, give me a second. Sorry. No, 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 no rush. We are fine. Okay, there we go. There we go. All these panic, these moments that make you panicky. Yes, no, no need to panic. Everyone is very Zoom familiar. Can Perfect. You see okay, good. Yes. So, Looks great. Uh, thank you for the wonderful, warm introduction. I'm very pleased to be a part of your lecture series. Um, I am uh, also by clan. I am I am Diné. I am uh, Koga, um, born for Ashihe, my father's. My grandmothers, my paternal grandmothers are Kikichitni. My paternal grandparents are um, Twitichit, uh, see, Token uh, Shlon, Ashihe, Bashashin, Kikichitni, Dashiche, Tohatlini, uh, Tohatchi Dan, I used to Dan, I'm originally from Tohatchi uh, chapter um, on the Mexico side of um, 
the Navajo Nation, and I'm often, I used to um, go to Cortez very often, so I'm familiar with, um, with the area. My parents um, lived in um, Anity, Utah for a while, for like 10 years, so we you know, Cortez was one of the closest border towns, so I'm familiar with Cortez. Um, today, I would like to share with with your audience um, a work that's in progress for me, and it started out um, as a project that was looking, focusing on Milton Snow's uh, photographs. Um, and this is the, the front cover picture that I have here um, is a is a Milton Snow photograph. And I was several years ago, it is more years than I want to say, I was having lunch with a dear friend of mine, Martha Blue, um, who her and her friend of hers um, were planning to write a biography of Milton Snow. And I went to see her because I got interested in the Milton Snow collect, photo, photograph collection. And, and there isn't anything substantially um, published on Milton Snow. Um, and so I became um, interested in Milton Snow's collection which um, the, the Museum of Northern Arizona has his collection, including the written documents, um, and the Navajo Nation holds um, the collection as well. So I meet with my dear friend, Martha Blue, who's a retired attorney, lives in Flagstaff. We have breakfast and she, as we're talking and I ask her about Milton Snow's collection, she hands a file over to me and she says, you know, my friend was working on this. She got too old and she can't finish the project. So we were working on it together, she said. And now she says, I'm handing it over to you. <laughs> so I am hoping that um, I won't take too much longer to complete this project um, and that I won't need to hand it on to somebody else. So um, in this work then, um, I'm looking at Dene. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put myself on, let's see, I, I can't do it. Um, so, um, in this uh, presentation, which is a work in progress, so please be um, uh, patient with me, um, because it's you know especially the the work that I'm doing on the Solon Kimball uh, so Solon uh, Tuthiger Kimball's papers, which are at the Newberry Library. Um, this era, the era that I'm looking at in Navajo history, covers the livestock era in Diné history, the 1930s, 1930s, and into the 1940s. Uh, the collections that I want to share with you, because I'm a historian, is the Snow Collection, which is housed at the MNA Museum of Northern Arizona, and then Solon Tuthiker Kimball's papers, which are housed at the Newberry Library in Chicago, um, Illinois. Both of these collections offer a window into an, into, um, an era that was tumultuous and ultimately suggests us why we, why we see the conditions of life that we do on the Navajo Nation in the present. It is during this period that the transition into capitalism took, took on an urgency as the federal government sought to alleviate the problems they had caused um, when Indian Commissioner John Collier implemented draconian livestock reduction policies. So what I'd like to do is to share some preliminary analysis with you regarding the Navajo problem, and I'll define that, um, but simultaneously also Navajo resistance. Um, so I want to share both of those uh, collections with you, uh, Milton Snow's photograph collection, and then um, Sal, uh, uh, Kimball's um, collection um, as well. So I want to start first by um, just showing you a map of the of um, Navajo land. Um, I'm a historian, so I pay attention. I've been pay I pay quite a bit of attention to um, the transition that happens in Navajo life um, in the um, aftermath of, of Navajos um, being held as prisoners of wars, prisoners of war by the United States um, from 1863 to 1868. They're returned to. Um, a portion of their homeland in 1868. And you can see the, um, the rectangular um, land reserved as reservation from 1868, and then all of the additional lands through president, US presidential executive order that, that is um, added um, as Navajo land, um, with the last one being um, added in 1934 on the Southern side of um, the Navajo nation. So I just want to give you um, this visual so you can see what the area that we're talking about. Um, I want to start with um, the livestock reduction. I, I mentioned um, the long walk and how this was really uh, um, 
uh, transformation and transition of Navajo life um, under American occupation and will continue to live under American occupation. But another um, transforming moment for Navajo life was the livestock reduction. And in fact, um, this reduction, uh, this um, transition in Navajo, of Navajo life um, in the 1930s and 40s really heralded in the kind of life that we see um, and which I'll talk about, which is life on, um, within a capitalistic system, um, the introduction of the wage economy, um, the introduction of American education, um, the introduction of a dem democratic form of, of government for the Navajo Nation, um, and simultaneously also um, Western concept of families, um, because the notion of family, the concept of family as a, nu as a nuclear unit really is the foundation of modern nation building. And so we're seeing this in this work that I'm looking at, we're seeing this um, transition of Navajo um, families and Navajo government, um, all aspects of Navajo life as part of this project to transform people uh, Navajo people into modern citizens of not only the U.S., but also of their own nation. And so um, start with this um, image from um, Milton Snow, uh, because livestock, um, uh, before the livestock reduction uh, mandate mandates, um, Navajo people um, relied heavily upon the livestock industry um, as a way to sustain their lives. Um, and it's connected to how they, how we regard the land, how we conceptually organize our lives. Um, in, and it includes our um, organizations of political life, economic life, um, um, our ceremonial system as well. And so sheep have been very important um, in that organization. And so I wanna share this uh, photograph from um, Milton Snow with you. Um, let me see. I want to start with this photograph and then I'll go back. So this is Milton Snow. Milton Snow was hired by the Indian Service and the Indian Service is an arm um, of, the, of the Soil Conservation um, Corps. Uh, he was hired by the Indian Service in 1937 to document the government, the, the federal government's rehabilitation program, which he did for, do, uh, he did for two decades. While Kimball was contracted was contracted to map Navajo responses to the government's to the government's implemented policies, both of these um, men um, noted Navajo resistance to livestock reduction. Um, and I think looking closely, more closely at Kimball's papers, um, which was evident the resistance Navajo resistance, which was evident in the northern region at Shiprock and Annis, offers reflections about what is still considered traditional Navajo life based on, on, life, on livestock, a way of life that although still practiced is largely not viable today. So I share with you some preliminary analysis regarding the Navajo problem and Navajo resistance, okay? And I wanna go back because um, one of the things, one of the, the ways in which the federal government fashioned its approach to Navajo people and pretty much um, it, just overall, um, their treatment of indigenous people um, during this era. Um, the, the Navajo, it was called the Navajo problem in official correspondence. So um, Navajo considered the, Navajo, the nation's most foremost problem. Um, the question was, you know, to um, bring Navajo people into the modern era, considering the kinds of devastation that we were seeing as a result of um, the livestock reduction, okay? Um, and so it was considered um, called the Navajo problem consistently. And you had a whole bunch of people from, you know, um, white, white reformers, anthropologists, archeologists, ar journalists, writers coming out to assess the Navajo problem and how to offer expert um, opinion and programs to rehabilitate the Navajo people. So this is 1946. Um, you might be familiar with the anthropologist Clyde Tluckhone and, and Dorothy Layton. And so, you know, this was uh, the central question for, um, for uh, white reformers and federal officials, officials is how do, we, how do we transform Navajo people so that they're able to become um, integrated into American society, but also um, as modern citizens of their own 
nation. Um, there were so many studies done during this time. Sociologists like Kimball were coming out, all kinds of people were coming out and taking an incredible amount of, of data and doing statistical analysis. And so this is one of the, um, one of the charts that I found in terms of um, assessing and, and creating data and statistics, you know, all in hopes of um, providing uh, and implementing um, what they consider to be real, real rehabilitation programs um, in the aftermath of uh, the devastation of the Navajo economy. So um, here's another photograph of uh, Milton Snow. Milton Snow, um, he's the one with the white t-shirt, um, short sleeves, uh, and he's here with his um, assistants. He took over 12,000 photographs of Nawals and Hopis. And even though these, pho these photographs are very familiar to Navajo people, um, they are, we are, from what I've seen, they have a response uh, um, to the photographs, but they often won't, we often won't know um, who created these photographs and they don't know, we don't know um, Milton Snow's names. Um, so he, uh, this is the this is the van that he traveled on on, on reservation roads. Um, it was he had inside of the van he had a traveling uh, photo lab, and he slept on top um, of his van as he traveled throughout um, the reservation. Um, and he was assigned, Snow was assigned to visually document Navajo life for a host of federal officials, Indian experts and Indian reformers who desired to believe that white beneficence was embraced by their chargers, by their charges. Writers, journalists, artists, collectors and other travelers produced imagery of Navajos for popular consumption. And so in his documents, in his, the files that exist of uh, Milton's, from Milton Snow's collection indicate that um, his, his his photographs um, were used in, as illustrations in all kinds of documents from federal reports to Life magazine to uh, all to reports. And so, you know, and, and a lot of times um, he, he's not given credit for um, the photographs that he sent um, to uh, across these different venues. Um, one of the projects, um, because we're talking about livestock reduction era, we're talking about environmental devastation of, of Navajo land. And um, Milton Snow was supposed, was um, charged with documenting the devastation of the land, okay? And so um, he often did before and after photographs. Um, the reason for that is because we take visual imagery to be evidence of proof, okay? That, that a program is working, for example. And so, um, what he did was, um, in, in some of the um, uh, work that he did, was to show how the land had been denuded, um, environmental devastation. They were in a 10-year in a, um, drought cycle in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and ultimately, the, the, the um, blame was laid on Navajo livestock. Navajo people just had too many sheep, and we just didn't know how to take care of the land. And so it was the beneficence of the federal government to come in and share and offer their, their Western technologies and expertise to help Navajo people learn how to properly deal, take care of their land. Okay. And so that was a, a government project. And so um, this is one, uh, another photograph uh, of Milton Snow near Mount Taylor. Um, so It was um, the federal government believed that it was the best in the best interest of Navajo people whose livestock had so denuded the land of its grasses and the top and the topsoil was blown away. It was absolutely necessary to mandate environmental protections. Um, Navajos were forced to reduce their herds of sheep, goats, and horses by 50 percent beginning in 1933 and ending in 1947 through a number of measures. First, by gaining the agreement of the tribal council widespread education to inform on the necessity. And then when Navajos continued to um, resist uh, the mandates, um, they were then met with um, threats of violence um, and coercion. And, um, you know, so, and then you actually see that the, um, 
the government's violence um, in the on the uh, with Navajo resistance in the northern region, which is what um, Kimball um, records in his papers. And so this um, these government programs, the rehabilitation program to address the Navajo problem, not only um, did it address um, land issues, okay, um, the, the state of the land, but it also um, intended to re to engineer um, all aspects of Navajo life. 1930s and 40s, um, and particularly the 50s, is really the introduction and the paving of the way into um, resources extraction, okay? And so you can see a lot of the language that is applied to third world countries and it's talked about um, underdevelopment and bringing um, people in underdeveloped um, countries, including the Navajo Nation into modernity, into um, development. And so here, uh, um, Milton Snow also created um, photographs that were like life size, because at this time, Navajo people were largely um, illiterate in the English language, and they were primarily uh, Navajo speaking um, uh, people. And so this is tribal fairs. People love tribal fairs. They think it's just about fun and entertainment. Um, the earliest tribal fairs in 1938 were actually um, part of the planning and strategy to, to um, create Navajo um, acceptance of mod moder modernizing projects and, and to begin to pave the way for resource extraction, for example. So Navajo people are at a fair here and they're looking at the sawmill, um, uh, a three-dimensional model um, at the fair um, and an exhibit so that they begin to, they're beginning to be brought into um, the valuable, the values of resource extraction. Okay, and this one is the, it's, um, the forestry industry. Okay, and um, um, Snow also, you know, photographed these, and these were intended for a Navajo audience. Um, I want to mention a couple other things. It's already three four four twenty three, <laughs> and um, I don't want to get too far. I don't want to. Um, not share with you the work that I've been work on the work I've been doing on Kimball's paper. So, not only did the rehabilitation program extend to land and to paving the way for um, resources extraction, it also intended to impose a democratic model of government on the Navajo people. Okay, and today, through my work, um, some of my um, the, the essays that I've done, I'm talking about the in imposition of a hetero of a heterosexual patriarchy. Okay, and that that begins um, at Huelde, when the military and then the Indian agents take the um, authority of our our leaders away, and they completely erase and ignore um, women's leadership. Okay? And so you see this in this modern government. Um, this is. Um, you can see Chi Dodge here, the one who's wearing like a, a, a suit coat, the black suit coat. Um, he's, he's called the first um, modern chairman of the Navajo Nation. Okay, and so these, these um, policies and this implementation, implementation of a democratic form of government happens um, in the aftermath and, and as a response to um, the livestock reduction. Um, Milton Snow also education. Um, this is a, a, a photograph of Milton Snow. The 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 reform projects uh, also extended to education. It also extended to family. Okay, so here he did a before and after. Um, this Navajo child is not happy because for breakfast he's having fry bread and coffee, which is not considered a nutritious meal. Okay. Um, a, a photograph that was used in juxtaposition of this was a, 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 Nav a young Navajo child smiling because she had um, oatmeal and apple and a glass of milk. Okay. Um, here's one on education. Um, women um, families were not uh, were also targeted. It was thought that um, Navajo women um, didn't know how to fully be proper mothers. Um, and so the program also targeted family and ultimately um, created these expectations or these ideas about ideally a family was a nuclear family unit with a husband, a wife, and children. Okay. Um, Navajo people really love the baby pageant. 
um, which is still a feature at the at the fairs. Uh, the baby pageants were really started as a way to, to encourage women to come in and to learn from white women about proper notions, proper practice of hygiene and childcare. Okay, and so you can see here a Milton Snow photograph where the woman is very cheerful and happy um, while she's learned how to wash her baby properly. And you see the men that the man there with the microphone, you know, reporting to the crowd um, what is happening there. Um, in an effort to um, school Navajo people about um, the wonders of, of Western technologies in all aspects, the day schools that were created um, also in the 1930s began a cult, uh, um, culture culturally based programs as a way to bring Navajo people in. The day schools, which were established under Collier's administration, were also places where people were encouraged to come um, and be introduced. So women could come there and use um, um, sewing machines, for example. Okay, so this was a form, this was a way to get people educated into um, the wonders of Western, uh, of values that are associated with Western life. Okay? Um, this is a Milton Snow photograph on, you know, with, when you work with photographs, you often don't find, across decades, you often don't find, you often will find that um, the photographer um, has not named people. Here you see that he's written the names of the people right above their heads, uh, or someone has. Uh, and that the no names, or you don't find names very much, you don't find dates, and you don't find places that these photographs are taken. So this one um, has a caption on the back that says something like, Navajo people looking to Uncle Sam for a prosperous future or something like that. Okay, so um, Milton Snow's uh, photographs also operated as propaganda. Okay, this was this, as propaganda, it assured the federal officials and a larger audience that yes, Navajo people were embracing the wonderful programs um, that the federal government was offering, that they were really interested in becoming um, citizens of modern nations. Okay. Um, now I want to turn to, I'm going to stop a minute here. I have a whole bunch of notes that I wrote down and I'm just talking to you um, based upon um, uh, my, the work that I've done and talking to the photographs. So, so now um, the questions or some of my questions that I have have to do with how the photographs frame are framing certain kinds of understandings and creating a context of what Navajo life was like um, in this period. Um, I'm always interested in what's outside the frame of the photographs, okay? And so when I came across um, Sol Solon Tuthiger Kimball's um, papers at the Newberry Library, I was very interested in the way he, that he was um, mapping Navajo resistance, okay? Um, Kimball was a sociologist who investigated the conditions on the Navajo reservation during the livestock era. He worked for the Soil Conservation Service on Navajo from 1936 to 1942. His papers indicate that he was contracted to determine Navajo responses to the livestock reduction mandates. His papers include research notes and printed, printed material about Navajo social and economic organization. He was in communication with the federal officials overseeing the reduction and implementing reforms. From what I've read in his papers, he was asked to investigate Navajo resistance to livestock reduction mandates and deliver his report to the federal officials. His interviews, he interviewed a significant number of Diné about their thoughts on the state of Navajo life during this era. He also reported on the resistance in the Northern region, Annis, Utah and Shiprock. New Mexico. Um, he records um, large meetings of Navajo people. There was one document, for example, in which he records a meeting. Um, there must have been like 300 Navajo people. And the Navajo people didn't invite the appointed um, council delegates because they perceived and they thought they perceived that the, the elected officials did not represent their views and their resistance and their objections to livestock reduction. So there's one um, there's one report that Kim, in Kimball's papers where um, 
Navajo people are talking and are talking about strategies of resistance. Okay, um, and so um, in in the report that Kimball offers, there's a there's a um, a council delegate who comes to the meeting and he sounds very uncertain, you know, because he doesn't know how he's going to be treated. Um, there's uh, evidence that people were rejecting um, these elected leaders who were agreeing with the government that the only solution was livestock reduction. Okay. So the reports on unrest at Aniston and Shiprock. Um, the amount of, in, according to what I've read and uh, looked at in these documents, um, the amount of energy and resources that went into stomping out Navajo resistance was violent and intended to show Navajos the law of order. While we may think about the show of force at Standing Rock in 2016 as an isolated display of settler violence against indigenous people, in fact, settler violence is, at, is as the anthropologist Patrick Wolf says, a structure and not an event, meaning that every single time in the history of this continent, settlers used violence to contain indigenous people. Similarly, the production of intellectual period materials is also intended to overlook, ignore, sanitize, and erase any memory about indigenous resistance. For knowing means we understand and appreciate that our, our ancestors did not go down without a struggle. We learn about our ancestors' struggles, the terms of their resistance, the price of their efforts for liberation and uh, to live in a manner of their choosing. We do not have dissimilar struggles today. Okay? And finally, the shift in Navajo life that happens during this era um, is what haunts us in the present. So Kimball reports um, the authority of the government um, has he in a report um, he write to uh, to federal officials he writes the authority of the federal government has been challenged in two localities in the northern part of the reservation at Annis, Utah there has been threats of violence not only to government employees engaged in their proper duties but also to any Indian who conforms to government regulations at a meeting at a meeting June 17 eight mounted Indians appeared. And although no overt action occurred, the situation was serious, sufficiently serious that if any attempts had been made to arrest or remove any Indians for violation of the grazing regulations, my violence may have, been, may have resulted. At Navajo Mountain, reports Kimball, also in Utah, a small group of Indians not only threatened violence, but removed by force a, horse, a herd of horses that have been gathered by government employees. Threats have been made um, that any attempt to brand or remove horses would result in violence. At Denahotso, there was talk of arms and forces against the United States government. Although no action followed this meeting, the indictment to the use of arms may lead to serious results. It is more than probably that unless the government recognize the seriousness, seriousness of the situation and take appropriate steps, there will be physical violence. Okay, he goes on to report that prominent Navajos, meaning appointed or elected and sanctioned by the, by the federal government, proper, prominent Navajos have expressed regret at the occurrence of these two outbreaks and believe firm course of action must be followed. Okay. Um, previously, Kimball says they had been able to constrain Navajo resistance by appealing to elected and appointed Navajo leaders and through legal means. Okay, and then there's language in these documents about unreasonable Navajos and reasonable Navajos would understand the importance of the implementation implementation of these um, government um, mandates. Okay, so unreasonable Navajos resort to violence and never look at the violence of uh, livestock reduction. Okay. Um, he says, the problem we face is not one of the officious suppression of opposition. In fact, there's no possibility of the resolution of the conflict through compromise. The situation we face is a direct challenge to the government to enforce its policy on the Navajo reservation. Okay. And so one of the things that I've noticed, particularly when I looked at the 1913 so-called uprising at Beautiful Mountain, 
um, there's always on the sub, there's always um, this threat that federal officials use that they will, and in this case, they also make the threat that they will bring in um, the, the US troops, okay? They will bring in the milita military. And this, is, this causes a deep fear for Navajo people because they still have in their collective memory, their treatment by the US um, army at Huelde, at, um, when they were sent, their ancestors were sent to um, Huelde for four years. Okay, so the, this is the kind of coercion and threats um, that the government is willing to use against Navajo people if they resist. And so I've been um, working and thinking through this. Um, in the in the Aniff incident, resistors were tried through the Utah federal court. Um, a letter indicates that the officials are to make examples of the accused as messages to the Navajo public. Okay, this is what happens when you resist. So one last thing that I want to mention, and then I'm going to wrap up because it's already 4:36. Um, he took a, some. Kimball took a whole lot of, like maybe a hundred interviews. I haven't counted them. Um, talking to Navajo people and interviewing them about what they thought about this transition in the economy. Okay, and interestingly, and probably not surprising, um, older Navajo people. Um, a lot of them were very fierce in their interviews and talking about, um, you know, just saying, just leave us alone. Okay, we want our sheep. And then the younger people who've had like 45 um, and younger um, are have had um, experience with the boarding schools um, and with education and moving into a wage um, economy. And so they're seeing um, or stating, making statements about the value of a Western education. Okay, so you see this transition into um, a capitalistic system, into a wage economy. Okay? So I just want to share a, a couple, I'll just mention a couple here. This one is Manuelito, age 60. He's a silversmith and he's uneducated. Okay, um, he says, many of us grew up with the ban of sheep we now have. It becomes part of us. We hate to see them go. Sheep is all we know and we would like to keep them. We wish to be left alone with our sheep, okay? And this is a refrain that you see with the older ones, with the older Navajo people in the 1930s and 40s, okay? And then you see um, certain ones who, who um, are in the wage economy system and then recognize that they are in the hierarchy, they in the lower echelons of the higher, higher hierarchy in, the, in a wage economy, okay? Um, this one, interview with Harvey Dixon, age 40. He attended mission school in, in Ship Rock and he um, got some work um, with the, uh, the, conservation, the Conservation Corps. And he says, you know, the people are beginning to realize the advantages of being able to understand English. Um, this is um, Gray Eyes, who was very well known in the um, Chinle area. He, his interview is long and he is drawing upon a kinship system of responsibility and obligation um, that becomes distorted um, in, in, the, um, in what's happening in livestock reduction and the bitterness of Navajo people towards their leaders like Gray Eyes. And so Gray Eyes in his interview says, you know, I helped my people. And when I helped them, when I had a problem, uh, my daughter was sick, my, my relatives came, and they brought me coffee or flour or cloth goods or mutton to help me. Okay, there are some people though that don't think about returning help that you have given them. I think these people don't think about returning help that you have given them. <laughs> um, and so that's one of the things I think is really interesting is the shift in um, making or trying to integrate um, long-standing obligations that are based in kinship that are connected to uh, concepts of relationship to the land and not just to the land, but all beings, okay? And so this project has helped me work through some of those um, old, older Navajo um, uh, belief system about relationality, about obligations um, to not just each other as human beings, but to the land and all other beings. So that's what I'm thinking about. I want to end here with a tribute to my mom and dad and the work that I'm doing really offers a, um, a window into 
um, they're alive. They, my mom was born in 1930. My father was born in 1934. Uh, my mom was, um, they both went to boarding school, Sturt Indian School. That's where they met and married. Um, my mom, uh, they were both primarily English, um, uh, Navajo speaking. Um, my father was raised in the San Juan region in um, the Nahanzad um, Fruitland area. Um, they, he was, um, his family was a farming family. Um, they were both, um, as children, um, primary um, sheep uh, herders and then um, went to school. Okay, so um, they were probably, and some Navajo people would, would you know, um, beg to defer with me, but I think it was my parents' generation um, that was really the last generation integrated into um, a um, livestock um, based economy, but their lives also indicate this beginning of this introduction and integration into um, what had been part of um, Collier's um, reform plans, rehabilitation programs for Navajo people. My dad was a wage earner. Um, my mom um, spent her life taking care of her household, her children, her five children, and her husband. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I think about this and all the things that they, that I, I learned from them about this error um, and how much, um, how many more questions I still had for them um, before they um, took their, left um, this earth and moved to the next world, you know, and so I do want to dedicate this to them and I think about them very often. Um, last, so then um, I guess what I do want to say is that in these stories that I tell and what these documents um, remind me of is that storytelling is not consciously a seamless narrative with a beginning and in a story constructed tell us to tell a constructed tell us something's important and how it should be important, but and how we think about the past. For the Diné, we are, who we are and what we should be have been told to us in, endlessly. A, pol a biopolitic tells us that the settler state is not just about impend impending, controlling, or destroying life, but also with cultivating, organizing, administrating, and organizing it. The U.S. nation state has effectively mediated Diné relations between the body and the nation state, disciplining humans to form them as subjects of the modern state. And yet, um, as I find through storytelling and ongoing struggles, a tradition of resistance, of indigenous resistance, um, that now, now all people and indigenous people continue to remember and honor their ancestors' wisdom. Um, you can think about a lot of places where you see this continually happening, um, the resistance and the challenge to ongoing resources extraction, for example, the, the coining of the term water protectors, okay, um, the um, revitalizing every time we single time we have a prayer done a blessing way. Um, these are all forms of resistance that I honor and that I celebrate, you know. And so thank you very much for listening to um, my talk. Um, it's an ongoing one. And someday I, I, you know, I really need to work on this book manuscript. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I think we have time for questions. We do, we do. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Denadale. That is, um... And so much rich information. We love historians because of the just the, the depth of, of knowledge that you've discovered in the documents and the photographs. Um, so grateful that, that you shared that with us. And we have a bunch of questions. Um, I, I think I, I have to ask because of your last slide and your and your dedication to your parents. Um, they they were uh, sounds like still quite young during, um, you know, these, these programs, these reform and rehabilitation programs, but did, um, is, did they have stories or remembrances about being a young person while this massive uh, political and economic and social uh, transition and injustices were, were happening that, that they've shared with you? You know, I'm trying to make a transition from being an academic writer. <laughs> <laughs> to a creative nonfiction writer. And so um, in one chapter that I've prepared for this manuscript, um, I start with the stories of, from my parents of being children during this era. You know, my dad grew up along the, uh, the San Juan River. His father was a lightning way singer. You know, um, my mom heard sheep she was taken care of by her grandmother. 
so um so yeah they you know I, and then you you know as you get older and, and when you're young you're you know um maybe not everybody's like that but you just you're just foolish and you just don't spend enough time talking to your parents and and now i'm at a place where i wish that i had spent more time talking with them now i'm sure that's a, a sentiment shared uh, across all time and and cultures uh, as well um, I was curious about uh, sort of partway through your talk, just talking about the uh, the divide between the elected officials who were it seemed were being perceived as the the reasonable uh, Navajos that were that were um, going along with uh, and perpetuating um, some of these um, practices, and then the um, uh, the folks that were that were gathering and not inviting those those leaders because they don't believe they represented their interests. Do you have do you have a sense from your research of of what was driving those elected officials? Had they did they really believe that this was the best path for Navajos? Was there coercion or bribery or or uh, other other factors leading into that? You know, there was there's there's so many um, council records. You know, uh, with Collier coming to visit them, to visit Navajo people and to tell them that this is absolutely crucial, that they, they must follow government mandate, mandates, which ultimately will devastate the economy, you know? Um, and so, you know, with Gray Eyes' interview, which is very, which is very interesting, he, he's in it, you know, I read it with, um, as, as a tone of um, bitterness um, that he has for the way his people are treating him. And he, um, um, Kimball does say in several other places that, leaders are just meeting with criticism, you know, because they're not able to listen to Navajo people in a way that allows them um, to take some kind of alternative um, route other than um, getting rid of their livestock. And simultaneously at the same time, along the San Juan region, along the San Juan, the, the Eastern boundary, um, while well, Navajo herders were leaving work were forced back, you know, onto Navajo, um, designate Navajo land, um, sheep herders and cattlemen were coming in. And so, you know, that indicates like this contradiction in policy. Mm -hmm. Wow. The, uh, I was also interested in the the kind of a uh, generation gap uh, that, that you mentioned, um, the, um, the the elder leaders such as Gray Eyes um, e expressing um, his uh, his feelings about the disruption in kinship systems of reciprocity. Some of the other interviews that, uh, with Navajos that you described is that they were pretty fierce about leave us alone. This is our culture. And then on the other side, you had some young people uh, that seemed like they maybe wanted to um, jump into this new economic system. Um, uh, did, was that a pretty defined uh, split, generational split that you saw? Um, did the was there? Um, just wondering what was happening uh, with the with the young folks, um, maybe being being pulled in that direction rather than listening to to their elders um, and and following some of the more traditional cultural knowledge that they had had been exposed to. You know, I, I think this, I've read so many of the interviews and I haven't been able to. Um, um come to like some more some more do some more analysis and to come to come to some conclusions about that but i think it's a really those interviews are really a window into um that transition that's happened the transition into seeing uh, a means of livelihood because the economy is devastated um a means of livelihood through um a wage economy and that the means to um climbing that echelon, that ladder um, in wage production um, through education, you know. Um, in uh, some of the work that I've done, I've drafted a chapter. I really, I also look at some of the contradictions, for example, um, in the, in this period after livestock reduction, you have um, soil conservation coming in and attention to water development, okay, trying to develop available water sources, for example, um, 
hiring men um, um, to build dams, okay, to, to um, build roads. In the 1950s, there was, I forgot, like $88 million, the Navajo Hopi Rehabilitation Program to pave roads. You know, we think that this is, re this is really good. This, is, this will bring Navajo people into the modern world. Um, ultimately, it was about making accessible um, the resources that were available on Navajo land um, for extraction for uh, corporations and, and co companies to come in. Ultimately, one of the things, the most one of the most glaring things for me is that you could have this huge infrastructure, infrastructure which begins in the 20s and 30s and really takes off in the 60s to the 80s of building this incredible in infrastructure to bring to take Navajo and Hopi water to build the modern Southwest, um, to build these canals to Phoenix, so, so Phoenix can be not just in, more than just become their, um, their imagination. And at the same time, you know, those conditions, that infrastructure, that elaborate infrastructure to move water three, three to 400 miles, millions and millions of gallons of water, pristine water in Black Mesa to slurry coal to create the modern Southwest. And Navajo people today, they, they tell me about, you know, uh, show pictures to me on social media, um, going to um, the local pump to, to get water. Okay, 40, if people say anywhere from 30 to 40% of Navajo people still don't have working water. You know, what an incredible comment on what's important to this society when you look at Scottsdale and then you look at the conditions on the Navajo, on, on the Navajo people. Um, in some of my um, my most recent essay that I published on um, the Kosinsa 19, COVID-19 um, on the Navajo Nation, this infrastructure, this lack of an infrastructure, which is is really part of the 1930s and 40s um, with, with development happening and underdevelopment happening with Navajo people on Navajo land, is really important to understanding why um, COVID-19 just swept through our communities. Oh, absolutely. Um, we have a, a question from one of the participants who, who um, says that they, they believe that they've either heard or read that the land owned by uh, white ranchers surrounding the Navajo Nation was actually much more degraded uh, environmentally from, than, than any of the Navajo land and that the white ranchers were uh, paid for their livestock, which was then shipped by a railroad to stockyards while the Navajo livestock um, may have been shot and left to rot. And they, uh, this participant was wondering if, 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 that, was, if that was true, what, what she had read or if you had um, seen that in your research. Well, um, I've been reading, and this, this has been a while since I, I need to return to those reports and documents, but um, particularly around the, the, along the Eastern boundary of, of Navajo land, um, white ranchers are moving in um, and taking a, in um, taking up the land that Navajos are forced to leave um, and be confined back on um, designated Navajo reservation, and so there's that contradiction of, of these rancher white and Hispanic ranchers coming in, and yet at the same time the federal government is is blaming Navajo livestock right. for the conditions of the land. Okay, um, uh, systematically since Navajo people returned from Huelte in 1868, and particularly in the 1880s, there's just document after, just document, document after document of Navajo herders and ranchers who are forced out of prime grazing areas, land that they had used, you know, for decades, um, where the sheep and forced out when, when ranchers come. Um, in the Tuba City area, the Western region, um, in the 1880s, there's documents about the Mormons coming in, you know, and taking over prime spots, and then there's, there's conflict and tension. Um, in Winslow, um, Navajo ranchers, Navajo herders are forced out of their places at, at the threat of gunpoint. Okay. Wapaki, the Peshtakai family, you know, were in the dead of winter, um, were, were forced out of their land by um, Babbitt's um, the Babbitt Company's uh, rancher um, cowboys. So, so it's there's a cons there's a consistency in terms of Navajo relationship with um, incoming um, settlers. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have someone who, who, let's see, I have to find, look at my, my questions here. So, uh, one, one of, there was just a, a really profound um, uh, comment from one of the listeners that's, uh, that says that some folks may not understand um, some, uh, you know, the, the really drastic nature of, of the reduction and the impact on the culture that the animals were known individually to people, um, the, the emotional impact of, of seeing that slaughter. I, I noticed in, in the um, interview quote that you had um, that someone pointed out, one of the interviewees had pointed out, well, I grew up with these, with these animals. Um, I, I knew them by name and uh, well, that wasn't so much of a, of a question. I think it, it does uh, kind of make me wonder about the, the social memory of this um, enormous uh, trauma in, in Navajo communities today, if, if that uh, sort of inter, intergenerational trauma is, is manifesting itself in, in communities um, uh, and uh, in resistance and, and social justice movements today. I, I do have a section in this um... Um, essay that I'm working on, one of the chapters in which I do develop and talk of, um, more expansively about Navajo concepts of life and philosophy that is, um, of which livestock is very, very important, you know, and some of the stories that Navajo people tell from this period, um, there, it's, it's, it's gut-wrenching, it's very emotional, um, and they say things like, you might as well just cut my heart out, you know, um, so yeah, it's it's very um, it's very emotional and it's very like the, the the fathoming that you know the federal government can actually do this again. And so in some of the um, in some of the Navajo stories, I see um, I read the link to how they were treated at Yeah. We have um, let's see there. I don't know much about this in particular, so hopefully I'm, I'm answer, asking the question correctly, but one, one of the listeners asked uh, about a specific kind of, of sheep that how did the livestock reduction affect the Navajo churro sheep? That was part of um, the introduction of the a different kind of sheep, and I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's the Rambouillet, um, was to try to was to introduce new improved technologies, including a new improved sheep, okay? The churro for Navajo weavers was really um, produced the best wool. Um, and so that that has made a difference in, in weaving as well for Navajos. And at the same time, I mean, and, and then simultaneously, I think now you see a number of weavers and a lot of them are men right now, um, weavers who are bringing, who have brought back the churro sheet and, and um, churro wool for weaving, you know. And so I think um, I don't intend to make this like a, a, a story that's just about devastation. Um, I think that the story that I'm seeing here is this um, tradition of resistance, you know, that it just doesn't, it's not told. I mean, I never knew about the resistance that Anna Ben Shabrock and, and, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, the mountain, what, what was that one called? The other one that I mentioned um, in um, Northern Arizona and Southern Utah mm -hmm. uh, about just the amount of resistance. And then the, the, the resistance that takes place now with revitalization, um, there's like, for example, one of the, one of the projects that um, across, you know, spectrums, um, now who people are working on is food sovereignty projects. Right. No, that uh, I had I'd made a note about that. I uh, your your one of your slides at the end with the picture of, of protests at Standing Rock and this um, concept that the historical work that that you're doing is exposing the the degree to which there there was uh, uh, resistance in these time periods and the the thought that this is inspirational to to modern activists. Um, do you feel like there's the 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 word is getting out that that there's um, public education that uh, might be impactful and useful to um, resistance and social justice, uh, indigenous social justice movements uh, happening right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm privy to those, um, some of those movements and some of those um, conversations and actions that are happening. 
Um, a lot, maybe some people are just not aware that so many things are happening. And I think that to know about them, to participate in them is just really revitalizing. Mm -hmm. Well, we will, we will certainly, uh, public education is something we, uh, we work on here at Car Canyon, part of our mission, and we would love to help, uh, help circulate um, uh, your work. And we've had, we've had some questions uh, uh, in the chat about where can we find uh, the work that you've published. And um, if you wanted to say anything about that, uh, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, Taylor can, will definitely send, send out websites and, and contact information. One thing I will say is check, I'm gonna write it down in the chat. Okay. Check Google Scholar, okay? So when you Google, um, Google, uh, Google Scholar, and then type my name in there and you will get um, a list of my publications, okay? Most of my work is in um, journals and as book chapters. And I find I'm now coming to some kind of, um, reconciliation with myself that I'm primarily an essay and book chapter writer and not so much a manuscript writer, which I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's okay. Oh. Well, we're, we're, uh, we're a little bit over time. So we want to be respectful of Dr. Denendale's time. Uh, there are some, some really nice uh, comments. You've really touched uh, our, our, uh, participants and, and Taylor, hopefully you can um, make sure to pass on some of the comments uh, that that have been posted to Dr. Denadale about their um, their own personal experiences um, uh, with this with this and and their their questions and their and their compliments to Dr. Denadale. Thank you so much uh, for for your excellent presentation and we Becky and I would love to come down and visit you sometime and we we'd sure love to host you up. Crow Canyon. I would future. love to come to Crow Canyon. I absolutely I need to go to Toyak. So oh, perfect. We can <laughs> we have connections in Toyak. So we would love to to bring you out. Thank okay. you so much. We sure. uh, Thank you. loved your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye bye.